Welcome everyone, thank you for joining. It's that time of year again. We're getting towards the end of the year. And this is where it's always fun to look at our portfolio and try to piece together how it's been going and our kind of our plans for the future, our predictions for the future. Last year, I did a similar video. I went over my top three picks for 2021. And in that video, I outlined the three stocks, Google being my highest conviction pick, and then Netflix, and then Amazon. Those are my three picks. Now, let's go ahead and just take a look at how those did those three picks. We have Google year to date up 70%. This is by far the best pick. This was hands down the best company that I picked to invest in. I was lucky enough to make this my highest conviction bet. I put some money into it and it went up quite a bit, up 70% just year to date. So Google has performed very well so far. Netflix was my second highest conviction. This one's up 26% and it was a little shaky throughout the year. It really has been up and down. It's very volatile. Throughout the majority of the year, I held this stock getting no returns. And a lot of people left comments like Netflix is not going good. In fact, Netflix is going to fail because of all these streaming companies. Then over the past couple of months, with the release of a lot of their key series, a lot of their flagship series that they have, and Squid Game, the stock price has gone up quite a bit. It's up 28% in just the past couple of months. So overall, we're up 27% with Netflix as of now, barely outperforming the S&P 500, but outperforming it nonetheless. And then Amazon, my third conviction pick of 2021, this one has struggled. It really has. The past couple of quarters have not been good for Amazon. They're missing their earnings, they're missing their revenue, they're having tons of issues with COVID and logistics and pricing and hiring people. They have to give out huge bonuses to retain workers. It's been a challenge for Amazon, but despite that, investors have not given up on this company. It just has too much, uh, too much good reputation in its past for investors to give up on it. So Amazon, despite struggling this year, is still up 11.7%. It's underperformed the S&P 500, but it's still in the green nonetheless. So between these three companies, Google, Netflix, and Amazon, the results are not too bad. One of them was kind of with the market, another one was a little bit below it, and Google was way above the market. I think overall we did okay. In this video, what I wanna do is a similar type of thing, but I'm gonna be expanding it to 10 companies. So we'll have the top 10 companies, the ones that I have the highest conviction for 2022. And this could change in the future. I will make videos if this changes due to new insights and new news and new developments with these companies. But as of right now, I think that these 10 companies are some of the highest quality assets in the world and they have enormous growth potential and they have limited downside. So they are a mixture of what I think are very good investments. So we'll be going through each of those companies bottom to top and I'll be explaining why I'm investing in all of them and showing you the fundamentals of these companies. Now, let's go ahead and before we jump into that, let's just take a look at my portfolio here. As you know, this channel, we do things real. I don't just talk about investing. I don't just share my thoughts, but I put my money where my mouth is. This is a portfolio where I invest in the companies that I'm talking about. The ones that I'm bullish on, I actually buy a stake in. And not only that, but I show you week by week the performance of these companies and of the portfolio overall. So if you wanna follow along with a real investing journey and see how this goes week by week with live updates, whether or not the market goes up or down or this portfolio performs good or bad, you can follow along for free. Now, as of right now, the Story Fund is at a valuation of $111,700 and the gains as of right now stand at around $19,700. So I think so far it's doing okay. But if we benchmark this against the S&P 500, for the past few months, I had been above the S&P 500. You can see that I'm outperforming it here. My portfolio is in blue and the S&P 500 is in red. Then this portfolio took a complete nosedive as Alibaba fell like 10% in one day and it just continues to fall. The portfolio is doing well overall, aside from Alibaba. Almost every day, most of the companies and most of my larger positions are going up and Alibaba's going down, dragging the whole performance of the portfolio down. In fact, I've done the math. I've actually looked at this as if I didn't lose any money in Alibaba and I would be ahead of the S&P 500 right now. So this loss, the reason that I'm 2% below the S&P 500 as of right now is almost entirely due to one holding. The losses in Alibaba right now are around $3,000. That's by far my biggest loss. The next closest is $1,200 with Spotify. So not even half as much. But this is how it goes. Some companies will do exceptionally well, like Google, 
and some of them will struggle. Over the long term, I think this company might be able to make back some of the losses it's had. So I'm not selling as of right now, but this one has been a pretty painful holding to hold so far. It's really hurt my performance. But overall, this is the portfolio. I give week by week updates. It's real investing, real money, and real companies that I'm buying. And if you wanna see how I perform against the S&P 500, if I'm able to outperform it from now till 2025, again, you can follow along for free. Just subscribe to the channel, and I'll have weekly updates on this portfolio and how it performs against SPY. All right, now let's go ahead and jump in with my top 10 picks for 2022. The top pick may not surprise you. It was my top pick last year, and it's my top pick this year. It's Google. I think that this company, even though it had an outstanding 2021, is gonna have an outstanding 2022. Google returned something like 70% in 2021, and I think that it's gonna continue into the future. Let's go ahead and look at Qualtrum Insights to get some fundamentals about Google. And if you're not familiar with this website, I created Qualtrum Insights with some developers that I've worked with for years to give you the most well-rounded and concise look at the fundamentals of a company. So in this software, you just type in a ticker symbol like Google, and then you're able to see all the fundamentals of a company on one page. This is included with the Patreon at no additional charge. I would make it free, but I have to pay for the data and the Patreon helps support that. So if you're interested in this application, you can join the Patreon. Not only do you get access to the Discord, the exclusive episodes, uh, my buy and sells and all that type of stuff, you also get Qualtrum Insights included at no additional charge. So let's go ahead and jump into some of the fundamental data here. What we wanna look at first off with any company is the valuation of the company. Google, as of right now, trades at a 26 forward PE ratio, while the S&P 500 as a broad index trades at around like a 22 PE ratio. So Google, with the qualities of this company and with the future growth outlook, is trading just slightly above the general market. And I have to believe that Google will grow faster than the general market. There's lots of people saying that they had too much growth in 2021 and they can't keep that up. The comparables this next year will be very difficult against last year. They say that every time. Tough comparables, tough comparables. Google is going to grow. Ad revenue is going to YouTube. Ad revenue is going to Google search. Ad revenue is going to platforms like Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. It's moving away from linear television. It's moving away from radio. Companies like Google, and especially Google, have very long-term tailwinds, the wind at their back just pushing them along. And this company is taking full advantage of that. If we go through some of the fundamentals here, we'll start off with the revenue here. The revenue is growing pretty steadily. It had a little bit of a dip in 2020. I saw that with my ad revenue, but then it quickly recovered and the revenue is going up like crazy. In fact, if we look at this annually, it paints even a clearer picture. The revenue goes up every single year, year over year. And Google's increasing the revenue anywhere from 20 to 40%. It won't always be that quick in the future. It'll probably slow down and taper off a little bit, but this is a company that's going to find ways to grow their revenue. They already have huge platforms that I think will grow for the next 10 years. Now we can see that the company's growing revenue and Google's growing that quickly. So that's a big check mark for a growth company. We can also look at EBITDA. EBITDA is the earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. So this is a proxy for earnings. Now we're moving past just total revenue and we're actually seeing some, some metrics that show you the earnings of the company. EBITDA is one that a lot of accountants try to use. It strips away some of the things that can kind of alter the earnings of the company. And so this is just a variation of looking at how profitable the company is. It's very similar to the net income or free cash flow. But you don't want to just look at EBITDA because it can misrepresent some companies. And some companies, you really don't want to look at EBITDA at all. I would say that banks are one of them because you don't want to look at the earnings of a bank before the interest. The interest is a huge part of a bank. But EBITDA with Google is, is relevant to look at. And the EBITDA is growing very strong. This is a really good sign for Google. You know that this company is not only able to grow their top line revenue, but they're growing their profits, their actual earnings. They're keeping a lot of that money. Now, after EBITDA, we can see that Google's also growing their free cash flow. What is free cash flow? Free cash flow is how much money the company keeps after their capital expenditures and after their operating expenses. So after you minus out the money that it takes to actually run the business, like to open up plants and facilities and be able to operate the business, this is how much money the company has left over. Google has a lot of money left over. Check out these last couple of quarters, $18.72 billion of free cash flow. This is minus their capital expenditures. They have $16.39 billion of free cash flow two quarters ago. This company not only generates a lot of revenue, 
But lots of companies can generate revenue. Google does something beyond generating revenue. They keep a ton of it for themselves. They can generate revenue cheaply and keep a lot of that economics going on in between. And then we also have the final earnings, which is the net income. So the net income is considered the bottom line. This is what's left over. And the revenue is considered the top line. This is all that's taken in to begin with. And all this stuff that happens in between can be captured in the EBITDA, the free cash flow, the capital expenditures, the R&D, the sales and marketing. There's lots of stuff that happens in between the revenue and the net income. But that is the top line and the bottom line. So just to summarize the stuff we've looked at so far, we have the revenue, the EBITDA, the free cash flow, and the net income. And of course, we have the PE ratios. We know from the PE ratios that Google's being priced as just moderately above the rest of the market. It's not outrageously priced. It's not a super expensive company. It's a little bit more expensive than buying the S&P 500. But we also know that Google generates lots of growing revenues and the revenues are very consistent. The revenues, did, they didn't dip a lot during 2020. So they're resilient. These are good revenues. They're also keeping a lot of the economics that happen within those revenues. This isn't a company that takes in a ton of money, but has so much capital expenditures, so much employee costs and sales and marketing that they're not able to actually keep that money. They have to just give it away to continue running the business. Google keeps a ton of the money for themselves. With these four graphs, I can see that this is a company that's growing. It's growing its profitability in EBITDA and free cash flow and net income. The next thing that we want to look for is now the balance sheet, the stability of the company. Are they in a distressed situation where they have a ton of debt compared to how much cash they have? How good is this company's financial standing? Well, Google does have debt. We can look at the debt right here. We can see that they've increased their debt a little bit over time. My guess is that they took advantage of these low interest rates. So the Fed lowered the interest rate and you can see Google's tech go up uh, over double. So these are smart people working at Google. They see an opportunity, interest rates are bottom, they're, right? they're at zero and Google takes out a ton of debt not really a ton compared to how big they are, but they doubled the amount of debt. I think this is strategic planning from Google. They're taking out debt at a very opportune time. Right now, Google has $12.3 billion of long-term debt. And long-term debt means debt that is due over 12 months. So they might have some extra debt that's due within the next 12 months. But as an investor, what we want to look at is their long-term debt. And that's what this graph illustrates. So they only have $12.3 billion of long-term debt. Now we can look at their their cash balance by comparison. Google's cash balance is literally an order of magnitude, even higher than the amount of debt they have. They have $12 billion of debt currently, and they have $142 billion in cash. So they have 14 times roughly the amount of cash that they do debt. This is a company that is the opposite of distressed. They could go through incredibly uh, turbulent, terrible economic times and be just fine for years. They have so much cash on hand, which is opportunity to do acquisitions, to reinvest into different projects, to take long shots. They have a lot of things they can do with this cash. Some people look at this as a negative. They say that Google doesn't know what to do with the cash. They're not innovating, they're not spending it. But I think that if you take a conservative approach, I think that this is a positive. They are a well-capitalized business and that protects them from the chance of ever going bankrupt. So Google's never gonna go bankrupt anytime soon. Zero chance of it. Their revenue could completely plummet and they have enough cash balance to run their company for a very long time. And right here, Qualtrum Insights, under balance, gives you a summarized view of the company's balance sheet. So we have the cash, which is the amount of actual cash they have, plus very short-term investments like three-month treasuries and stuff like that. They consider that cash for a company. Google has $142 billion in cash. They have $12.3 billion in debt, which is a net $129.7 billion cash position. So Google is cash rich. Now, moving on from the actual cash position, we know that the company is generating a lot of earnings. They have very low debt. They have a ton of cash. We can go ahead and look at how fast they're growing their earnings. Peter Lynch said it best when he said that it's pretty simple in investing. Companies that grow their earnings will have the stock price go up. Companies that earn less money will have the stock price go down. That's basically as simple as it gets. If you find a company and it grows its earnings quarter after quarter after quarter and year after year, you better believe that stock price is going to go up over time. It's just a matter of time. Google has obviously grown its earnings like crazy. Look at this over the years. It just has continued to grow and grow. And then right here in 2020, the earnings spiked. Now, I will give a little bit of a warning here. Google grew their earnings so much in 2020 to 2021 because the ad market came surging back with huge demand that this is unlikely to continue at this pace. 
I think they'll still grow their earnings in the future, but it's gonna be at a slower rate. So I think it would be a mistake to assume that Google's gonna grow their earnings like this in the future. I think that's just unrealistic. Now, after we look at the EPS and see that they're growing their earnings per share over time, there's one really important metric that a lot of new investors miss, and this is shares outstanding. This is really important for a couple of reasons. Think about what you're doing when you buy a stock. You're buying shares of a company. Now, if the company has five shares and you buy one share of it, you own 20% of the company. The reason that you own 20% is because there's five shares outstanding. If they issued out another five shares, you would own not 20%, now you'd own 10% of the company. Your equity in the company would be cut in half because of something called share dilution. That is a dilution act. That means that they created more shares diluting your ownership of the company by 50%. Companies do this all the time. They issue more and more shares, especially growth companies. Growth companies have their share count go up, diluting the shareholder and making it so that in, in terms of percentage of the company, you own less and less and less of the company. Every single additional share that they issue of that company, it makes your portion of the pie a little bit slimmer and slimmer and slimmer. So it's not always a bad thing to have share dilution because sometimes the companies need to raise cash and they do that by selling shares and raising cash that way. And it's not always a good thing when companies do buybacks. Sometimes they should be using their money for other things. But generally speaking, when a company is cash rich like Google and they're using that money to buy back shares, they're increasing your equity stake of the company. So over time, without buying any additional shares, your portion of the Google Pie is increasing and increasing. You might go from a tiny percentage, like 0.001% of the company to 0.002% of the company, right? As just as an example. So what we wanna see with good growth companies that are cash rich is generally speaking, you wanna see this share count go down. That means that your equity in the company is increasing. And with Google, you can see that the share count is going down. It's a strong trend going downward. In 2018, they really started to do their share buyback. It went from 695 million to 694, to 694 minus 700,000. Then they went to 690, 688, 683, 681, 677, 675, 671, 667 and 664. They're buying back shares aggressively. And as Google is doing this all the time, buying back their shares, my portion of the Google pie is increasing without me buying any shares. Just by virtue of less shares outstanding, I have a bigger portion. So this is exactly what I like to see. With most growth companies, look at the shares outstanding over time. And in some cases, you will be appalled by how much you're getting diluted. Some cases, growth companies will dilute you by 50%. They'll issue twice as many shares, making your actual holding of the company half of what it used to be. And in my opinion, that's really dangerous. That does cost investors a lot, unless they're really doing something good with that money that they're generating. In Google's case, everything looks solid. This company across the board is as solid as it gets. And you can see this illustrated in the fundamentals. They're growing the revenue, they're growing the EBITDA, they're growing the free cash flow, they're growing the net income. No matter which way you mix and match their income, it's growing. The debt is laughably low for the amount of cash they have. They have in excess $129 billion in cash. Their earnings per share is spiking upwards. It's just growing incredibly, bringing down their PE ratio. And then their shares outstanding, of course, are going down, not up. So your equity is increasing. And to add the cherry on top of that, the company's selling for a 26 PE ratio, which is, in my opinion, relatively cheap. So going back to why I have Google as my top pick, it's the entire package here. Not only does the company look good from a fundamental valuation perspective, but consider the properties that they have. They also have YouTube, which is growing like crazy. They have Google search, which is gonna to continue to grow as again, more ads move to digital content. And they have Waymo, they have long shot projects with augmented reality. They have the whole business suite that Google operates with uh, all their administrative tools. They have uh, a lot of different projects they're working on in the background. And of course they have Google Cloud, which is gonna be the third biggest winner in cloud. So Google remains my top conviction of 2022. Moving on, let's go ahead and jump into number two. You may have guessed it, it's Netflix. This is a company that's a little bit more difficult to understand, I believe. Um, a lot of people, if I can spell it there, all right, Netflix. The big issue that investors struggle with with Netflix is the valuation. It's trading at a 51 PE ratio. But I think that the earnings are gonna grow much faster than investors are anticipating because Netflix is getting to scale where their 
huge fixed expenses are slowing down, but their revenue continues to grow. And when that happens, I think earnings tend to spike more than investors suspect. That's my thesis on Netflix. In my opinion, Netflix is a more risky investment than Google. So I'd only go into this one if you're very bullish on it. And if you see the same type of qualities that I see in the company, let's go ahead and go through some of the fundamentals. The top line revenue, it's grown steadily. 20% year over year, it continues to grow very steadily. You look at this revenue growth quarter over quarter and it's pretty amazing. We can look at the EBITDA. Netflix has grown their EBITDA steadily over time. That's a check there. Their free cash flow. This is one that has been a struggle for Netflix, but you can see the progress here. It's almost always been negative. And this was something that a lot of investors said would stay forever, that they would never have free cash flow. They'd never have money on the table after their CapEx spending and they're spending on all their films and their huge budget, but they do. They're moving to free cash flow positive. In fact, if we change this to the year over year basis, you can see that in 2020, they had $1.93 billion of free cash flow. It's gonna to be tough for them to keep this up, but over time, I think that Netflix will have free cash flow from here on out. I think the company will be self-funded. They won't have to go to the equity markets and they won't have to go to the debt markets. They'll be able to generate all the money they need to be able to fund all the expenses they have and all the content they have. So the free cash flow, of course, is not anywhere as strong as Google, but this is a much smaller company and it's right on the verge of becoming a highly profitable company. Look at the net income of Netflix over time. This is the bottom line. They're growing this, I think, incredibly fast as well. Again, as you meet that scale, Netflix has gotten to scale. They got to the point where now their free cash flow covers their expenses. We can look at the debt of the company. This has been one of the biggest points of criticism for Netflix. They have grown their debt steadily and there's a lot of investors and skeptics that said that the debt's gonna swamp them. It's gonna sink the company over time because they can't continue to grow this debt. Well, they're not. It reached 21.86 billion at the peak and look at it over the last three quarters. This is why it's so important to look at trends. Look at the trends with the company. The debt is not just 20.54 billion, but it's 20.54 billion that has been going down over the past four quarters. Netflix now has a trend of decreasing debt. And as they decrease the debt, the risk for the shareholder goes down with it. The cash on hand right now is 7.53 billion and they've increased their cash balance over the past couple of years. And my personal opinion, I think they're in a very secure situation. I think that Netflix has a very secure balance sheet. We have the earnings per share, and this really does paint a special picture for Netflix. This is one of those companies that people predicted would never make any money. You can look at the EPS and it's barely in the pennies. And then when they meet scale, when they get to 200 million subscribers and their fixed costs start to slow down, the company's EPS spikes like crazy. Look at this growth in their earnings per share. I predict that this will happen continually over the next coming years, over the next three to five years. I really think the earnings are gonna spike like crazy. And a lot of investors I think are gonna underestimate it. That's my prediction. Don't invest just based off of what I'm saying. You have to do the research yourself, but that's what I think is gonna happen with this company. Now, after the EPS, we can look at the shares outstanding. Like I mentioned, most companies that aren't as cash rich as companies like Microsoft or Google, they have to raise cash through various means. The two big ways that companies raise cash is by taking on debt through the debt markets or by selling shares of their company through the equity markets. Netflix has done both of these. They've taken on debt and they've diluted the shareholder. You can see that over time, the shares outstanding have increased. But again, look at the trends. Look at what's happening over the past three quarters. The shares outstanding are starting to go down. They're now actually reversing the dilution. They're doing share buybacks. So as the share count goes down, my ownership of the company increases. So Netflix, in my opinion, is one of these companies that's more high risk than Google. I think that investors should be more cautious investing in it. But if you think the company will eventually gain 400 million plus subscribers, I really think that everything right now is starting to transition in the right direction. The debt's starting to trend down. The shares outstanding are starting to trend down. They're doing share buybacks. The earnings per share are spiking, the net income spiking, and the company's now free cash flow positive, making it so that it doesn't need the debt or equity markets. Now, looking at the list in number three, we have Amazon. Once again, it's making my top three. Even though it returned only like 11% this year, I guess it's pretty good, but it wasn't like some big blockbuster year for Amazon. The stock has been pretty flat for the past year. But looking at the fundamentals, Amazon is another company that the PE ratio is pretty high. I think this puts off a lot of value investors. In my opinion, it's not 
as expensive as it seems. Amazon does, they do such aggressive reinvestment back into their business. That that's where a lot of their like free cash flow, a lot of their earnings go. And so it suppresses their earnings in the meantime until those bets play off over time. But looking at the fundamentals of the company, we can see that Amazon is growing their revenue. They're growing their EBITDA. Their free cash flow remains very strong. They have a lot of growth in their net income. They do carry quite a bit of debt. They have $51 billion in debt and they have more cash. They have $78 billion in cash. So if you do the math there, they have $27 billion net cash. So Amazon right now is a cash rich business. They're in no danger of going out of business or anything like that. The earnings per share have completely skyrocketed over the past couple of years. And this is what has driven the stock price higher. If this continues on for any amount of time, this company will be much more valuable. So a lot of that hangs on their actual earnings that they're able to generate over the next five years. My prediction is they'll be able to grow their earnings. We have the shares outstanding. This is one of the downsides, in my opinion, of Amazon. They have been diluting the shareholder over time. They've been issuing more shares, I bet, to pay for employee costs and stock compensation and those type of things. But you're getting a lesser piece of the pie as they continue to do this dilution. So I would hope that in the future, Amazon would take a little bit of their cash and use that to buy back some of their shares. I think they should do that at some point. So overall, the two big concerns with Amazon are the high P.E. ratio and the share dilution, every other metric looks very strong. They're in a cash rich position. The company's growth looks phenomenal. And I think that they'll have a very bright future. Now after Amazon, in number four, we have Salesforce, ticker symbol CRM. This has been one of my biggest conviction picks as well during last year, and this company has performed really well. It's sitting at a four PE ratio of 62. So it's kind of an expensive company based on their earnings, but this is one in the early stages of growth. You can see that they're growing their revenue, their top line growth is there, their EBITDA is there, free cash flow growth, net income growth. Their debt's at 2.68 billion and their cash is at 14 billion. So they're also a cash rich business. They have no problems keeping their business afloat. Their earnings per share, has been something that's been really strong over the past couple of years as well. Look at this EPS growth over time. I think this will continue in the future as they continue to gain market share. Salesforce is stealing market share from IBM and Oracle and lots of other SaaS companies. They also have the same thing that a lot of SaaS companies do, which is share dilution. So this is a downside with some companies. You have to just take it into account that a lot of companies that aren't really as cash rich as Google do have to issue shares and Salesforce is one of them. So as they increase their share count, I'm getting diluted, but I think they're using that money wisely and they're growing the business even quicker than they're doing dilution. Now, after Salesforce, we move even into more immature companies, ones that really are in the early stages. They're not really mature right now. They're just growing up, which is Spotify. This is one that I'm investing in for a combination of reasons. First of all, fundamentally, uh, Spotify can be a company that looks pretty tricky. The P.E. ratio right now is, I mean, it doesn't mean anything. It's 555. They barely have any earnings. In fact, if we go to the EPS here, you can see that last quarter they earned one penny, right? So barely anything. It's basically flat. But you can see that the earnings per share are kind of trending in the right direction. Next year, they're supposed to actually earn some money, which is a good thing. But if you're investing in Spotify, I'm going to be honest with you here. You're not investing in it because you're investing in a highly profitable company as of right now. You're investing in it because of the growth potential and the story of this company down the road. Spotify is growing its revenue steadily, 20% plus year over year. They're growing their engagement. They're growing the monthly active users on their platform. By the end of this year, they're expected to have 400 million monthly active users. So there's a lot of growth happening with Spotify, but profitability is really not their primary concern right now. So far, the company is really not profitable, but we'll see how this one does in the future. I'm still very bullish on it for a couple of reasons. They are expanding into podcasts. They're expanding into audiobooks. They're expanding into everything that includes audio entertainment. And the service is very sticky. Once users sign up for Spotify, they really like the platform. They tend to stay there. And I think that over time, it'll prove to be a very profitable platform. I think it will just take time for the company to mature. But right now, in terms of the actual fundamentals of the company, Spotify is a more risky company. It has much weaker fundamentals than any of these other companies. And you should know that before investing in it. After Spotify, we have Adobe. This is one that I have held the entire time. I'm still bullish on this company. I still think it's gonna do amazing. If we type in the ticker symbol here, it brings up Adobe. And this is one that's just wonderful to look at the fundamentals. I mean, it's just beautiful. 46 PE ratio, it's an expensive company, but you have to pay up for this type of quality and this type of growth. Um, Adobe has incredibly solid and consistent revenue growth. 
ever since they switched from the legacy business of selling you like a thousand dollar Adobe suite to the actual subscription service, their revenue growth has been as steady as ever. Then of course you have the EBITDA growth. This has been very strong over the past couple of years. We have the free cash flow growth here. You can see how much free cash flow they keep for themselves. We have the net income, the bottom line of the company. Then we have the debt. The balance sheet of Adobe is very strong. They have $4.1 billion in debt, which is quite a bit of debt, but they have more cash on hand. They currently have $6.16 billion in cash. So they have around $2 billion in actual cash plus their debt sitting around ready to spend. They actually did pay a dividend up until 2005, and it looks like they discontinued the dividend. So that's something interesting. They no longer pay a dividend. They're completely viewed as a growth company right now. The earnings per share, again, is where this company really shines. Around 2012 is when they started shifting to this SaaS business, and Adobe did this in such a smart way. They took an earnings hit while they were making that transition. But you can see around 2014, the earnings started that steady climb, and the climb has continued. Look at this earnings climb. If a company does this, it's gonna be worth substantially more. Investors at some point will pay more for these earnings, and Adobe's being bid up in price because they think that this will continue. I'm very bullish on their future earnings. I think they're in a great industry. They have a lot of opportunity here. On top of that, Adobe's one of the companies that's not diluting the shareholder. They're actually trending down in their share count, meaning that we're getting a bigger portion of that pie. We're getting more of the company. Now, one note on this chart, the x-axis, the horizontal axis, starts at 476 million shares. So it doesn't go down to zero here. This is to show trends over time. If you had this chart start at zero, it'd be very difficult to see the actual trends and which quarters are doing the most share buybacks. So this chart illustrates a trend over time. So I'm gonna continue to hold Adobe until I see real competitors take real market share from this company. That's when I'd start to sell it, if I was concerned about actual competitors. Right now, I don't see anything really taking away from their Adobe Creative Suite. And they have lots of other tools as well that they're going into. Lots of AI stuff, lots of artificial intelligence. Adobe has a lot of growth ahead of them, and they've really cornered a highly lucrative and growing market. Now, after Adobe, we have the next one, which is a company you may have heard of called Apple. This is always one of my top convictions, and that's not gonna change until Apple starts. They, they stop making products that people love. Once they stop making products that people line up at the door and pre-order and, and just really love in general, um, I'm not selling the stock until that changes because as of right now, Apple just hits home run after home run. They have the Apple Watch, the the you know everything they come out with, the AirPods, the phone, the new MacBooks. Look at the reviews of their products. This company makes good product after good product. And I think that investors are underestimating Apple's efforts into their other business ventures into things like the Apple car. I really think that a lot of investors are underestimating how seriously they're taking this. Apple is building a car and they have a pretty decent engineering team. They have a pretty good chip making team. They're able to, to manage software and hardware together pretty good. They have a history of doing that. I'm very bullish on their the Apple car potential. I'm also bullish on Apple augmented reality and they're battling Facebook with that. Facebook is very public about it, but Apple I know for sure is working on the same thing. Apple TV Plus is another thing that I think investors are underestimating. Apple's putting a fortune into media. They're gonna be one of, I think, the long-term winners of the streaming wars. Right along with Netflix, Disney, and Warner Media, I think there's gonna be Apple with Apple TV Plus. So overall, the fundamentals of this company we've looked at before, they're just phenomenal across the board. Everything is moving in the right direction. The company's highly profitable, but they also have a lot of growth potential, a lot of long shots that they're doing, a lot of things that I think could open up enormous new markets for Apple. And in my opinion, based off the risk reward right now, I still don't see a ton of downside and I see a lot of potential upside with this company. So I like the risk reward trade-off with Apple. Now after Apple, we have number eight. This is one of my top convictions. It's a much smaller company, a more volatile company, a more risky one overall. It's called Twilio. And if you're a software developer, you'll probably be familiar with this company. About a third of software developers have worked with this company. So it's a company that was started by a software developer for software developers, and that's the way that it sells. People use this company, or rather companies use this company, to do all sorts of different type of online communications. And it mostly started with text messages. The way that Uber would alert you that your Uber has arrived was through a text message sent by Twilio. These are the ones that, that run it. They're the ones that have the whole infrastructure, the whole backbone to be able to send those text messages. And the best part of Twilio 
is that they have a revenue model that makes it so that as a company like Uber uses Twilio more and more, they pay Twilio more and more. It's one of those usage-based models that companies like AWS have and other big services have. So Twilio, I think, is an excellent product. It has an excellent way of monetizing as well with that usage-based system, and that's evident in their revenue growth. It's astronomical revenue growth. You're buying a company that's still growing their revenue by like 60, 70% year over year. That is incredibly fast. That is the thing that you have to focus on with Twilio is the growth of the company right now. They're not in profitability mode. The company loses EBITDA and free cash flow and net income. They're losing money all over the place. The big thing that you look at with this company right now is the growth. And can they keep growing at this speed? The PE ratio makes no sense because the company isn't profitable. Their earnings are in the negative the past couple of quarters. But again, this one comes down to growth. And like most growth companies right now, this one is also diluting shareholders a little bit. So as I said before, this is a more risky company and I could see investors avoiding this one because it's gonna be far more volatile than most investments. But in my opinion, Twilio has cemented itself as the go-to messaging service. And as long as that's still relevant, as long as we need to send text messages, send SMSs, uh, communicate in any way, even through phone and automated phone conversations, all of that is done through Twilio. So I think overall, this company will still have this infrastructure role in our digital economy. And I think that the valuation of it will go up over time. And there's some things I could jump into in more detail about this company, about how they can gain profitability, but I'll save that for another video. After Twilio, we have another big tech company, Microsoft. I've gone over this one a few times, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. The fundamentals are picture perfect. I call it the poster child of the best fundamentals of any company. Across the board, the revenue growth, the EBITDA, free cash flow, the declining debt, the growing dividend, the amount of cash they have on hand, the explosive earnings per share growth that they've had over time and consistent earnings per share, and the declining shares outstanding, make this overall fundamentally, I think, the strongest company in the world. Probably even stronger on a more fundamental basis than even Apple. And that's saying something. And Microsoft sells at a higher price. The price tag is a 36 PE ratio for a company that historically has grown a little bit slower than some other companies. That's the price you pay for this level of quality. Microsoft is a much higher quality company than almost every company out there. And you have to pay up if you wanna buy that, that type of quality. The big growth story with Microsoft is certainly Azure. That is where most of the growth is gonna happen, is with Microsoft Azure. They've been growing at 50% year over year, beating out every single other cloud service in the United States, in the world. It's the fastest growing cloud in the world, even beating out Amazon right now. It is in second place. Amazon AWS still has the majority market share, but I have very high hopes for Microsoft Azure. I think that this thing is gonna be huge over the next 10 years. So I want more Microsoft and as much of it as I can get. I think it's a very high priced company based on the immediate future. Over the long term, I think we'll look back and think that this company was cheap right now. And then my number 10th pick, last but not least, we have Atlassian. Ticker symbol is T-E-A-M. This one has been on a good run, so it's having a little bit of a pullback right now. But I think the good run is not really a reason to exit this position. It trades at a very high valuation, a 44 price to sales. That is an expensive company based on price to sales, but for good reason. Atlassian to me, is kind of like the Adobe for software developers. If you think of Adobe as being the suite of products that creatives use, content creators and artists and uh, filmographers and different people creating lots of media, they use Adobe. Well, Atlassian is kind of the same thing for developers. They have a suite of tools that developers use from project management to Git repositories competing with GitHub and Microsoft. Atlassian really sells almost everything you need as a developer to help manage your development. And so this company has kind of cornered that market of development project management software. It's a very good market to corner because every company has become a software company to some extent. They all want developers. They all want good project management software. And Atlassian is right at the forefront of that. So even though you're paying a high price to sales and a high PE ratio, I think this company will keep growing as they continue to grow their top line revenue, which as of right now is by far the most important metric to look at with this growth company. It is in the stage where investors are looking for growth and not much beyond that. So that's it. This is my list of the top 10 growth companies in 2022. This is my picks and we'll see how this does. I think that not every one of these are gonna do amazing, but I think overall they have a very good chance of outperforming the market. And I think that they're very solid companies that will give 
very good shareholder returns over the long term. So those are my picks. Let me know if you agree or disagree or if I left out any companies. And also, if you want to try out Qualtrum Insights, the, the website that I've been using, there's a link in the description. If you haven't tried it out, I don't know what to tell you. You're missing out at this point. So give it a shot. I think you'll really like it with your research and companies. And if you do, join the Discord as well, because that's included as well. So I'll either see you in the Discord or I'll see you in the next video.